Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. This study is in the Acts of Jesus, Lesson 41, the rest of the story. Hello, welcome back to our midweek study. Hope things are going well for you. Let's uh, start off with a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we uh, lift our hearts to you. We uh, thank you, God, for another day. We thank you for the hope that we have through your son, Jesus, and we thank you for your word that you've given to us. Uh, to guide our path, and we want to be guided, God. We want to be, and we want to submit to what that guidance is instead of coming up with how you should do it, Lord. We should, we should, how we should be submitting to how you're already doing it. Thank you, God. We pray you'd guide us. We thank you for the study so far, the things that we've learned. We pray you continue to help us to understand. Give us your Holy Spirit, God. He is our teacher and our instructor, and so we're trusting him and what you're doing through him today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 20, where we're going to be. If you'll look with me down in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we're going to be there in just a bit. But before we do that, I want to put a couple of slides, actually six slides, on the screen. Uh, popular excuses for falling asleep in church. Here's uh, slide number one. Uh, there it is. Uh, boy, that cold medicine I took last night it just won't wear off. That's a, I guess that's a decent excuse. Here's, here's another one. Uh, this is one of the seven habits, highly effective people, which is true. Uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind of sad that you're having to do that in church. Uh, here's another one. Uh, well, excuse me for staying up all uh, Saturday night in prayer. Well, um, if that's what you did, then I guess we can, we can excuse you. Uh, here's another one. Uh, uh oh, something's not right. There we go. While I wasn't sleeping, I was meditating on the mission statement, and envisioning a new paradigm. Yeah, I bet you were. Uh, another excuse for sleeping in church. Uh, I thought this was the healing service for narcolepsy. Now that's pretty good. And then here's my all-time favorite. Uh, I heard this qualifies me to be a deacon. <laughs> yeah, or a pastor. If we were sitting through uh, the kind of church service we're going about to read about today, uh, wow, anybody would fall asleep in this one. We're going to be looking at, I want to be speaking to you about uh, today, uh, taking a look at this guy, a guy by the name of uh, Eutychus. Uh, his name is unusual and his story is unusual. Uh, but he is certainly the patron saint of all who have fallen asleep in church. Uh, let's take a look at his story. We're in Acts chapter 20. Look down with me at verse 7. And this is Paul nearing the end of his missionary journeys. It says, on the first day of the week, we were gathered together to break bread. Paul began to talk to them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Whoa. I don't know when the last time you heard a sermon that was that long, but um, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. Notice the we there. So this is Luke speaking. He says, I was there. I saw this. And there was a certain young man named Eutychus. Here's our, our uh, heroine, of, our, our hero of the story sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. Can you feel his pain? Because, man, he's, Paul has been speaking until midnight. And it's late at night. Paul's been speaking for hours. Uh, of course, I understand he's not coming back anymore. I don't know how you speak that long. But anyway, he was overcome. Eutychus was with sleep, fell down from the third floor, and was picked up dead. Man, you just thought falling asleep was not that big a deal in church. Well, it can be. Verse 10, but Paul went down and fell upon him after embracing him. He said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. And when he had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak. And so he departed. So basically Paul speaks for a solid, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours. Wow. And they took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. And this story is uh, having been hit with a sleep bug, I don't know about you, on several occasions in church. I uh, can't help but chuckle. Uh, reminds me of the story of a pastor who had a particular church member who fell asleep in every one of his services. So he decided one Sunday that he was going to play a trick on this guy. And so this is what he did. About halfway through the service, he said uh, in a very low voice so that it wouldn't wake the guy up until the guy went to completely sleep. He, uh, in a very low, low voice, he said, uh, all those who want to, uh, I should say in a soft voice, all those who want to go to heaven stand up. Of course, everyone in the congregation stood up, and the guy who was sound asleep didn't hear it. And then he said in the same tone of voice, all those who want to go to hell stand up. Except when he hit the word stand up, he said it very loudly, stand up! And the guy heard it. Of course, the whole congregation sat down. The guy stood up in his place, and he didn't 
All, he had been sound asleep. He woke up and he looked around and he noticed no one was standing except for him and, and the pastor. And he says, well, preacher, I don't, I'm not sure what we're voting on here, but it looks like just me and you are in favor of it, he said. So, uh, you know, stories of people falling asleep in church. We can all, if we've attended church much, uh, certainly appreciate that. And practically every sermon and commentary I looked at uh, concerning the whole story of Eutychus went off on, took it as a jumping off place to talk about how the church is falling asleep and the world's going to hell. And that's certainly an application we could make from this. And, and uh, I can't help but feel sorry for Eutychus, though. I mean, can you? I mean, think about this guy who's just sat through seven to ten hours of someone speaking. I don't know what it is, care what it is. It's, it's going to be rough for me, I don't know about you, to stay awake. And here's adding insult to injury. You know what his name means? Eutychus' name means fortunate. Kind of like the one-eyed, three-legged dog that you named Lucky. Well, he is lucky, right? He's lucky to be alive. And the same is true with Mr. Fortunate here. He's Definitely lucky to be alive and as tempting as it would be to preach on this whole issue of the perils of people sleeping, Christians sleeping on the job and uh, great as the title of a sermon would be, you snooze, you lose, you know, as tempting as that is, I really wanted to pursue something different and I believe it bubbles, of course, up out of this, uh, out of this text, uh, the tragedy of, of his circumstances and I want to talk about the necessity of something that Mr. Fortunate was badly, apparently in need of, so are we, and that is a thing called rest. I want to talk to you about rest today and what the scriptures have to say about that. And of course, too much rest is laziness, but not enough is also almost as bad. And it's going to be uh, interesting for us to find out together that Jesus was very much in favor of the right kind of rest. And I want to give that to you today. Uh, we're all familiar with the rat race, right? And as soon as we think we're running the rat race, along comes a faster rat. And unfortunately, we fail to realize that even if we win the race, we're still a rat. And it's still that way. And uh, Jesus has come to give us rest. The good news, he's in favor of it. And rest, in fact, if you'll think about it, is the main point of uh, one of the Ten Commandments. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, what does it say? You shall rest from all that you're doing. Everything in you know, your male servant, your female servant, your, your animals, everything shall rest. Why? Because God is big on that. He knows he created us that way, whether it's a result of the fall or whether it's a result of just human nature. But however it is, God has created us that way, and that's the way that we are. And uh, Jesus, of course, takes his disciples away on several times to places of solitude where they could rest. And uh, so it's important for us to, to grasp this whole issue as we see it in the, in the context of Scripture. The best description of rest, the rest that we kind of, kind of, the kind of rest that we need, is given to us by none other than Jesus himself. Take a look with me here. It's going to be on your screen right down there in the corner right here. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Here's Jesus' own words. Notice his descriptive of what, what the kind of rest that we need. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So if, if that is true for you, and it will eventually all be for us, we need, we, he always already told us where we're supposed to go. Come to him. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find, there it is again, rest for your souls, not just your bodies. I mean, we really need rest for our souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to talk to you about the rest that Jesus describes here, the right, not just any kind of rest, the right kind of rest. But before I do that, I want to talk about the wrong kind of rest or what, what, he, what he doesn't say that we need. I'm not saying there isn't a time for some of these things, but notice he, he's, he's talking about the real rest, the thing that really energizes us and really makes us all that we can possibly be uh, in him and for him. Again, pay attention to what he, told, what he does not tell us to do. He does not tell us that we are, need more leisure time. He doesn't say that, notice there in Matthew 11. He also does not tell us that we need to take a vacation, even though there's nothing wrong with that per se. He doesn't tell us that we need bed rest, even though we definitely do. Notice, but he doesn't add those things. He also doesn't tell us that we need to go to church. Uh, church is not a place for rest. I'm not saying that you know, falling asleep in church is not... Not the thing I'm referring to. We don't go to the body of Christ. It's not within the body of Christ. The body of Christ can supply so many things for us, and it does, and we need to be relying upon the body of Christ. Yet, nonetheless, it's not the place where we can really find rest for our souls. So having laid those things aside, if you will, I want us to look now at what he does, what it, first of all, what he doesn't say, 
And now let's look and see what he does say. At least four things this passage teaches us about biblical rest. Uh, the number one most important thing here, let's go back to Matthew 11, if you'll put it, put it on the screen there for you again, Matthew 11, 28, 30. Notice he says, it, it, he starts the whole subject of rest off with a, with a statement. Come to me. Come to me, he says. He is our only place of rest. Uh, nowhere else. If we're going any, listen, anywhere else to find real rest, there's nothing like rest for your soul. You're going anywhere else outside of Jesus. You're not going to be real rested. You're not. The Old Testament picture of our current existence as New Testament believers, the Old Testament picture is the picture of the children of Israel in the wilderness wandering. Uh, they're, they're wandering out there in the wilderness and the experiences they had there teach us so much about experiences that in the, in the places they had to go for rest is the same places we have to go for rest today. Think about it this way. They were in a trackless wilderness, right? Uh, no water, no food, uh, nothing green. The only nourishment they had, the only water that they had, the only food that they had came from God himself. Now, there was plenty of stuff to eat. Now, I say that they could have filled their stomachs with uh, uh, sand. It would have been filling, but it would have not been nourishing. Likewise, we live in a world that is trackless. It's a trackless wilderness, spiritually speaking. There is nothing here for us. And we can fill ourselves with the stuff of the world. We can, and it will fill you, but it will not satisfy. It will not nourish you. The world's stuff will just simply will not do that. We only find what we need in the Lord alone. The lack of was the truth true for Israel. Where, where did their food come from? It came from God alone. Where did the water come from? From God alone. Same is true for us as a Christian walking in this world. Our nourishment only comes from him. We find our rest in him. Again, the emphasis here uh, becomes even stronger when we consider what he says there in verse 29. Look again there at Matthew uh, 11, 11, 28 and, uh, through, through 30. Notice this, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is always implies two animals. Take my yoke upon you. It says, well, you've already got a yoke. You need to take that one off and you take mine upon you. And, and what I hear in that, among other things, is you need to be with me, Jesus says. You need to be with me. You need to be connected with me. That's where our rest is. It's in that, it's in that connection. It's impossible, hear me, to really rest unless you're really connected to him. You're feeling weary, feeling worn out. You're feeling overdone by the world and the experiences of the world. I'm telling you, there's a lot of us out there right now uh, that are under those circumstances. There is no rest apart from him. There is no rest until there is a reconnection with him. Notice something else that he doesn't say. He doesn't say, take my hammock upon you. He doesn't say, take my bed upon you. Notice he's not saying, you cease. He's just saying, let's switch, switch yokes. You got a yoke. You're on it by yourself. Now I want you to come be with me in my yoke. Notice he's not saying stop. He's just saying, do it a different way. Go about it a different way. That's the thing that you say, well, that's the last thing I need. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's the first thing you need. It's, it's not that, listen, people think, oh, if I could just quit, I'd be way better. No, it's not. You're not going to be way better. Notice, Jesus doesn't say you need the rest of quitting. You need the rest of his empowering. It, it's like having a car with no gasoline in it. Will it roll? Yes. Can you steer it? Yes. If you get it going down the hill, yeah. You can get a little speed going, but you're going to have to push the thing again. It's the difference between having a car with no gasoline and a car having gasoline in it. You were meant, if you will, for the gasoline of the presence of Jesus in your life. That's the only way you can be empowered. And, and, and otherwise, a, a, riding in a car with no gasoline becomes really weary. It becomes uh, terrifyingly uh, sapping of the energies that you have, where in fact, if you really rode the car the way it was supposed to go, filled with gas, engine running, uh, it's not near as tiring. Likewise, rest, the, the life that we were intended to have is intended to be filled with Jesus, filled with him. And it's, in, it's that empowering that gives us the ability to, to find, even, even though we're still going, right? I mean, one, one, either we're pushing it or it's, or it's being pushed by the gasoline of, of God's life within us. Either way, we're still headed somewhere. It's not, a, it's not a take the yoke off and don't put it on anymore. No, it's just put on a different yoke. It's not, it's not the rest of quitting that we need. It's the rest of God's empowering in our lives. And we need that reconnection. And he is the only place 
of rest. He's the only place. So, so first of all, we need that connection. And secondly, we need the direction that comes as a result of being yoked with him. We need that connection. That yoke implies this, this direction. Uh, a simple rule of plowing is that the team goes in the direction of the strongest ox. So if you take Jesus' yoke upon you, who's the strongest ox? Well, of course, Jesus is. So that already implies direction, you see. See, a lot of people come to me as a pastor and say, I need to know what Jesus wants me to do with my life. Well, I can tell you, I can most often tell you for certain, he's not just going to give that to you. What, what he's going to say to you is what I just said to you, is you need to reconnect with me. And it's in that connection that you will find direction. You need to reconnect with me because it's in that connection that you will find direction in the same way that two ox yoked together are going to go the direction of the stronger ox. So is it the same with you. When you connect with Jesus, it's, it's, it's being with Jesus, listen, that you get the direction. The direction isn't something that exists apart from him. It is not something that exists apart from your, your relationship with him. I'm not saying that it does it. I'm just saying he won't give it to you. He just won't. Because he knows what you're going to do with it. You'll mess it up. It's only in your connection with him that the direction is going to make sense. And so as you're connected with him, so focus on the connection. Don't worry about the direction. He will worry about the direction. The direction will come as a consequence, listen, of the connection. Make the connection. In me, you will find rest. You'll get awful tired otherwise of being in a yoke by yourself going in circles awfully tired. So first of all, connection. Secondly, which leads to direction, which is enforced thirdly and finally by instruction. Notice, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden or burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. We've learned that, right? And then he says, learn from me. So first connection, which leads to direction which is empowered or undergirded or enforced by instruction. Come and learn from me. Notice what he says. The things you're going to learn from me, he says two things. He says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. How's that going to give me rest? There's so much rest in those two things. So much rest. Come to me, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. In other words, learn how I'm living constantly at rest. Constantly, even though God is constantly always working, always doing, always about the things of, of his people, yet he's always rested. Learn from me, he says. The two things he says that we're going to learn that's going to help us learn from him is you're going to learn from his gentleness and you're going to learn from his humility. Let's, let's discuss both of those here very briefly. His gentleness, first of all. Gentleness just simply, simply means strength under control. All the world literally on his shoulders, and yet he's completely... He, he's, he's, he's not upset. He's not flustered. He's never in a hurry. He's never afraid. He's never anxious. How is that possible? See, see for us, when, when it's all on us is when we so desperately need rest. Jesus is under all that, all the time, and completely rested, completely gentle, completely strength under control. One of the best pictures I can think of is Jesus at his resurrection on that first Easter Sunday. He resurrects. Scripture says is that when uh, Peter and John went to the tomb, they went inside. Peter went inside, and they noticed that, that the burial clothes were off in one place and that the, the wrapping for his head, the napkin thing that went around his head, it was folded in a separate place. Who folded that? That simple answer. Jesus did. He resurrected. He turns around, listen, with heaven and earth hanging in the balance, having paid for our sins and bought our salvation and bought the right and the title deed to the entire earth and the universe, he turns around and folds, folds the napkin that covered his head. Who does stuff like that? I mean, with heaven and earth hanging in the balance, so many things to do, so many needs, so many prayer requests to answer. Why'd he do it? Suppose he did it because 
He wants to show his mother that she trained him well. You know, even in the worst circumstances, Mom, I, Mary, I'm, I'm still showing you that I know how to make my bed, you know, when I get out of it. I don't think that's what it was. Even though I think she probably taught him that. I think what it is, is just a simple statement of, I'm completely in control. There's no hurry. There's no anxiety. There's no rush. Everything is in the right timing. He's gentle. He's strength under complete control. He's not tired at all. He doesn't need rest at all, even though it's all on him, 100%. He's completely rested at all times. Learn from me, he says, for I am gentle. We need that gentleness in us, don't we? The more that comes on us, the more we need to say, I am completely, I'm, I'm trusting him for that complete control. Gentle and that humble, that's also, if you will, selflessness. Listen to me, there's so much of our tiredness that comes from pursuing what we want. Sorry. So much of our tiredness that comes from making sure we take care of number one. Listen, you want to be really tired and need a rest, worry all about your own stuff. You'll be tired all the time. All the time. The secret, listen, that Jesus teaches us, the secret of energy is serving others and looking out for their interests. You'll find all kinds of energy in that. Come to me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Boy, do we need that. Gentleness, that, that uh, strength under control, that, that humility, that it's not looking after my own interest. You'll get real tired of that real fast. But looking after others, serving them, there's so much energy in that. So much energy. So we have old Eutychus here. Falls out of a third story window. <laughs> Nearly dies and maybe did. Paul resurrections, resurrects him by God's grace. And his story reminds us that without good biblical rest, we are in for a fall. You are. Come to me, Jesus says. So that's where we go. We'll go anywhere else. Don't need another vacation. Don't need more leisure. Don't need more sleep. I'm not, maybe you need that. I don't know, but that's not, you're not going to be rested. Come to me in the midst of when nothing else stops. Stop and be with me. Connect with me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Let me rest you. Biblical rest, or we're in for a fall. But even when we do fall, his story reminds us that the consequences of that fall are not beyond God's grace, are they? I've been there. So have you. Maybe so again. But let's learn together. Learn to come to him. And we will find rest. And he will give rest for our souls. No, nothing else can. Nothing else can supply that. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the rest that we can only find in you. Forgive us for trying to fill it in somewhere else, stuffing ourselves full of what the world says is going to supply our needs, what's going to make us relax, what's going to give us the sleep or the, the quietness of mind. And it's not in any of those things, this trackless wilderness. All we have is you. Our supply comes from you, our filling, our nourishment, our sustenance. God, I pray that we would reconnect with you. Take our yoke, your yoke upon us. That connection, that direction that comes as a result, that instruction of gentleness and, and humility, making us something different than what we are something exactly what you want us to be. Thank you for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.